you have any change? No. Keep it then. Thank you, writer. I'm not a writer anymore. Welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad Post from Open Letter Books. I'm here with Tom Roberts from New Directions. And today we're going to talk about a few different things, starting with an update on the 2014 World Cup of Literature. Um, last time we talked to you, we'd been halfway through the first round or just over halfway through the first round. And now we're all the way to the quarterfinals, through the quarterfinals, in fact. So we can update everyone on that. We're going to talk about Joel Dicker's book, the Harry, the, what is it actually called? <laughs> the Harry Kubert affair, whatever it is. Yeah, the truth, the truth about the Harry Kubert affair. Well, K Bear? K Bear is how you would actually say it. But Kubert. Kubert sounds just, cooler. Kubert because of our childhood video game. That's literally the first thing I thought of. And that I fucking hated that game because of the diagonals. I'd always screw up and move sideways and fall. That was not my favorite game. I not agree. mine either. Nope. Um, but we're going to talk about that. Maybe talk about this uh, terrible penguin. 16 World Cup thing, which I was trying to look at, and which is just stupid. It's um, baffling. I don't understand how it works. It means nothing. It's just stupid. We'll make fun of that. And then we have rants and raves. So let's start with the World Cup of Literature, which I don't remember what match was done when we last left off, but the, the second round has already taken place. Um, and, and it went fast and furious because, like the World Cup, it went fast and furious. I mean, we've gone from... <laughs> This time last week we had 16 teams. We now have four. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's, that's how it goes. So Let, Let's just look at the quarterfinals then and just skip past the second round matchup. So the first quarterfinal that um, went up on Monday was Chile and Bolaños by night in Chile versus Italy and Elena Fronte's The Days of Abandonment. And to my surprise, Chile won. I, I would thought... say I was surprised. Um... I thought that was a bit of a toss-up. Um, I, I will say, I think mainly because of the people judging. Yeah. A different set of judges, I think Italy would have won. Yes. It was very close. I mean, it was 4-3. to three. If we had gone to, like, a wide... 4-2, to two, I mean. 4-2. to two. You know, critics, booksellers, people in general, I think Italy wins. I, I think the abandonment wins. I agree with you on that. I think that I, I, w- I was sort of surprised just because I thought people would give her, like, extra love. Right now, it's still pretty early in the, like, the, the weighing in, but it's uh, 68% have voted that By Night in Chile deserve to win and 32% against it. This is sort of surprising. Think, yeah. I always vote on these, like, first before everyone. I get to vote, like, four times. So I can, I can, I can always... Jacket in my favor. <laughs> um, <laughs> doesn't the doesn't it read your IP address and you can't vote more than once? It does, but I have multiple computers um, oh. and my phone. So sometimes, and, and certain ones, like I don't know, like a certain Australian book, I voted a bunch of times, and on the other computers that were in the office. <laughs> uh, this is seeing inside the sausage factory. <laughs> but this one I only did. I only did this morning, um, and just on one computer. So. <laughs> Hmm, that's interesting, though. But yeah, I thought I thought she would make it. So, too bad. Oh, yeah. Bologna's yeah, got to be a favorite for the final, though. Too. I love I love Bologna. So, and a lot of people on on Twitter were always saying like, if it was twenty six sixty six or Savage Detectives, it would definitely win everything. Neither of which are as Chilean focused as this book, which is why we didn't choose either of them. Um, but nevertheless, I still think that this is pretty damn strong and is has a good chance. Although, he's going up against uh, Sebald and Austerlitz. Because in the other quarterfinal, we had Bosnia and Herzegovina, or Herz- Herzegovina um, and How the Soldier Repairs the Gramophone by Sasha Snashik going up against Sebald and Austerlitz from Germany. And Germany won 4-3, to three, which I thought, I thought Austerlitz would roll that, that match. Well, when you asked me if I thought Germany would beat Chile in the immediate wake of learning that Germany had won. I said, I think Chile will win because I don't think that's Zabal's best book. 
Ironically, and I'm going to let you in on one little one little bit. One of the comments for the semifinal matchup is that By Night in Chile isn't Bolaño's best book, whereas Austerlitz is Sabald's, and so they vote for Sabald. I mean, I agree that that's not Bolaño's best book, but I'll take his third or fourth best book over Austerlitz any day. Yeah, we're not voting in this, so we can have all the opinions we want. Yeah, I've, we're both on the other side of the bracket. So so. I would, I would vote for Chile too. These are both New Directions authors. We do not publish Austerlitz, but right, that's uh-oh. true. But that's the only one that's on here still of a New Directions book. Is uh, uh, by Night in Chile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Austerlitz is with New Dire- or, um, Random House. Faces in the crowd is Coffee House Press. Yep. And uh, Pale Fire is Hash Shot. Uh, a little brown, yeah. Uh, yes, well, moving on to the other side. We have okay. <laughs> Mexico and the U.S. Uh... <laughs> Which is crazy. So, yeah, so Faces in the Crowd unanimously beat Uruguay and Mario ben- Benedetti's, um, fa- uh, what should we call it, The Rest is Jungle, 7-0. to zero. So that was a kind of a shellacking um, to get Valer- Valeria Lucelli into the semifinals against the Pale King, which... Um, only beat the Welbeck book by one vote. Four to three. Yeah. yeah. How I mean, disappointed are you? I'm pretty disappointed. I mean, look, I love David Foster Wallace and I love The Pale King. And um, Which point of fact you reviewed for Deadspin, which I linked to in one of the, the upcoming articles. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of David Foster Wallace. I'm clamoring for that book I when it, before it came out and... Mm-hmm. But, you know, I do love Welbeck, and I, I think mapping the territory is better. Well, you know, the whole argument that Pale King is not a complete book, and you've got right. you know, the heavy editorial hand in there, and whatever, whatever. I don't know how much of that is relevant. Um, I mean, you're, you judge what you're given to read, and what we were given to read was pretty damn good. Um, it's hard to nitpick, you know? I mean, we're also reading a translation of the map in the territory, and that was edited too by someone in France and then someone in the U.S. So who really knows? That that issue aside, I think if you just look at what each book is and, you know, I mean, it, for me it was like a coin toss, and I ended up going with Welbeck, partly because, I mean, I said it was more fun to read, and that's, you know, usually a tiebreaker for me in, like, deciding what to read next or if I like something more than another one or whatever, you know, pleasure is a thing. You know, you want to, you want to feel like you're willing to miss a subway stop and walk longer or whatever. Like right. you'd rather lose sleep to, to read something because it gives you that much pleasure to be reading it. And Welbeck, I think has that. Um, if only because the, the plot moves forward and is propulsive and, it's paced well and there's an actual narrative, even if it's over, you know, several decades and whatever. Whereas the pale King, I mean, look, it's a wonderful, you know, wall sized portrait of America. And I mean, a wide swath of America and boredom and monotony and all of our quirks and foibles and what it means to try to interact with each other in a very weird, you know, part of the country, which is sort of devoid of culture and, um, sort of lacks uh, a real sort of um, loud sort of culture to lean on the way, you know, Boston and New York and uh, Chicago and even like Pittsburgh and New Orleans and St. Louis to a certain degree, they all can lean back and say, okay, we've got this culture. This is us. This is what it means to be from this place. And instead you've got like the middle of nowhere, Indiana, and it's just boring. And you know, Illinois. Illinois, sorry. And it's just boring. And you know, these people's jobs, this compound, it's just, you know, they're trying to find meaning, they're trying to find connections and whatever. It's fascinating, don't get me wrong, but there's no actual, like, plot, you know? Right, right. Which is fine. Just saying, personal preference, I prefer the plot. Yeah, I, when I read Pale King, I read it, um, uh, there's a translator, Ross Benjamin, who had said something about that, how he read it was, like, collected... Um, or the collected posthumous writings of David Foster Wallace, rather than trying to read it as a novel. And when I viewed it that way as I read it, I enjoyed it even more, because reading each one of those bits as like kind of a set piece or as like a chunk of something, rather than having to try and make it into a novel. I don't right. know. What's interesting about the semifinal over on this side, or about all the semifinals, is that only the Mexican representative is alive. <laughs> Everyone else uh, is um, dead. Yeah, 
I mean, Sabald and Bolano and David Foster Wallace all died young. Yeah. We should point out. All died before. I mean, how old was Sabald? 52? Uh, we looked this up, didn't we? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, but he was, uh, I was just there too. He was, I, I guess, uh, I can't do the math, 57. 57. But he was in like perfect health when he died. Yeah, he had an aneurysm. Yeah. And that led to the car crash. So, yeah, so that's like a freak thing. So, he's, yeah. yeah, he was young. 57 is young. Uh, what you call it? Uh, Valeria Luiselli is uh, younger than both of us. Yeah. That I knew. David Foster Wallace wasn't old when he died either. No, he's still in his 40s, I thought. I was going to say the same thing, but... Uh, 47 or something? I'm not really sure. 46, yeah. 46, yeah. Um, and so your prediction is Chile and Pale King. Yes. I Look, I have not had time to read the faces in the crowd. I've heard many good things about it, not just from our judges as it's gone through, but um, from other people, you know, reviews I've read, just random recommendations on Twitter or whatever. Everyone seems to think this book is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I'm definitely curious to go pick it up. Um, but how do you compete with David Foster Wallace? I'll tip my hand. I'm voting for Mexico. I don't, I don't know that. I don't think it'll win, but I'm voting for it. Okay. Fair enough. It's your vote. Do what you want. That's, that's, I read it more recently. I, I like it. I like it, but I don't want, I don't want, I really don't want the U.S. to win our World Cup of Literature either. I'm, I'm really a bad patriot. You should go work for FIFA. I know. <laughs> Speaking of, we'll take one digression here. So uh, um, with the Real World Cup, the quarterfinals tomorrow or that are going to be, God, part of them will be done by the time this airs. But this is being recorded prior to so any semifinals, semifinals being played. Yeah. So Germany and Brazil. Who's your pick? Uh, now that Neymar's out, I'm taking Germany. Yeah, I'm going to take Germany 3-1. Although, if, 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 if Brazil makes it through, Neymar said he might be able to come back and play. That's crazy talk. <laughs> he, just, he just cracked a minor vertebra. Just a little Three one. Three of them. Just a, just a chunk. It'll be fine. He had to be flown <laughs> I know. Flying home on like a medevac because he can't even walk. Are Dude. you kidding me? He's not playing. There are amazing amounts of drugs that they have in Brazil. They can, cure, they can cure anything. There was, there was a, I saw the thing about it. I think it was on Deadspin. And it was like uh, Google translated from a Brazilian paper, and it was absolutely ludicrous. But um, on a side note to that, did you see that Suarez is being signed by Barcelona? So it'll be Messi, Neymar, and Suarez. I don't pay attention to club soccer, but that, that's terrifying. No shit. And, and yeah. And swor- that's just too much. I, I don't need to find a new team to pay attention to. Um, okay, and then on the other one is Netherlands and Argentina. And I'm totally rooting for Argentina. I don't think they'll win. I think they'll lose in, in extra time. But I'm pulling for Argentina with all that I have. I'm putting all of myself behind Argentina. In, including against the other two teams? I mean, look. No, I just, against, just against Netherlands. Oh. Look, I you know, I like the Netherlands. I like Robin. I like Van Persie. I like Schneider. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the way they play. Say what you will about the diving, about whatever. But I feel like Robin earns it. So, but you think they're going to win too? Um, I really don't know, to be honest. I really don't know. I don't think Argentina's defense is very good. Like, and by not very good is is me politely saying I think their defense is fucking awful. <laughs> I really do. I'm surprised they have made it this far. They didn't give up a single shot on goal, though, in the last game. They gave up, like, two. Was it even two, or was it just one? I'm uh, not sure that that's a factor of their defense, or their defense being good, oops. as it is the, odd, the other offense just being terrible. I don't know, but Argent, or, uh, Belgium's defense is not terrible. Or offensive, yeah, whatever. I can't find it. I don't know how to find actual stats on soccer games on ESPN. Belgium looked, I don't know, like they'd lost a step or something. Yeah, they're both. Everyone looked exhausted yeah. in this quarterfinals. France, in particular, just looked just oh, not even God. there. They weren't even like remotely 
involved in that game. No, that was heartbreaking. That was pretty bad. Um, okay, so you want to talk about the Joel Dicker book. Do you want to set this up? Um, sure. I don't know how I first heard about this book. I will say I think I heard about it when... What the hell is that? Oops, my fault. Sorry. I'm trying to find the, this information, but they had four shots on goal. I think I first heard about this book, and what, did we already forget the title? The Truth About the Airy Kiber Affair by, what is his name? Joel Dicker. Joel Dicker, uh, who is Swiss-French, right? meaning he's Swiss, but writes in French. Um, and seems to affiliate himself more with French literature than anything else. Well, he's from Geneva, yeah. uh, which is right on the border, so I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but so this was published in October. No, when was this published in in, in Switzerland? Uh, I think it was published by the French publisher in last October during their Rentree thing. Two thousand twelve. Is it two thousand twelve? Yeah. yeah, that's okay. two years ago now, isn't it? Yeah, and so it's been translated into I'm gonna forget it many many languages, but it took a while to get into English. Um, uh, it sold millions of copies in Europe, all over, two million copies overseas. It surpassed Dan Brown's Inferno on the European bestseller list. In May, it was finally published in the U.S. by Penguin Books. And I heard about it right about that time because somebody told me that Penguin was sort of congratulating itself for having found the next Stieg Larsson. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, well, that's that's interesting. I mean, I thought I thought the idea of the next Steve Larson had sort of passed when we, you know, every major publisher had tried to find a <laughs> Scandinavian thriller, and none of them really worked uh, on the same level. I'm not saying there weren't good books, and but nothing has sold quite in the in the numbers that uh, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and the whole the the rest of the series sold. Then I saw this book on bookstore tables. And for one, I am not a fan of the cover. It's kind of just – and look, it's unfortunate. The poor designers have to deal with a really long kind of weird title and you got to fit it all on there. Um, but it's not a very exciting cover. No. But I picked it up and I read the description. It's not really – like look, I don't think Steve Larson is a very good writer. But that's a far more compelling thriller plot than what we've got here. This this novelist coming to the U.S., stumbling in, like, living in a small town in, I think, New Hampshire? Yes, New Hampshire, in a rural beach town, um, where his writing teacher is, who is the, the, the guy in the title, Harry K. K. Bear. And then somehow there's a, a girl who goes missing and found, buried... Didn't she go missing like 33 years ago and yeah. was found, yeah, had been missing since the right summer here. of 1975? Along the manuscript of K-Bear's canonized book. The Origin of Evil. In the author's yard. So our, our protagonist, um, you know, fresh off the boat or plane, tries to get to the bottom of what happened. And, you know, there you go. So we've got a book within a book and blah, 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 and it's... You know, it's just not as fascinating to me as as um, the girl with the dragon tattoo. That said, but the the real reason that this article exists, and this was written by Alice Gregory for the New Yorker. I don't know if it's in a actual print edition um, of the New Yorker, or just on the the Page Turner website. But the we'll put the link up there. It's uh, written what three weeks ago, June eighteenth. And it just hasn't sold. They printed, where is it saying here? Do you remember? Uh, 125,000 copies. Which is huge. This is a paperback original. Like, for, you know, some perspective, I'm pretty sure when Liz Gilbert's new book came out, they probably printed about that much. Okay, also worth noting that this is one of the biggest original acquisitions in the history of Penguin Books. There you go. I'm sure it is. I mean, I worked there. Yeah, we never paid that much for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder how much they did pay. I'm going to try and find that out as you say. It doesn't say. 
Anyway, um, Lee Gilbert has like clearly got an established track record. You know, Eat, Pray, Love sold millions and millions of copies around the world. And on the first printing of her new book, they're probably going to print 100,000 copies. And they printed 125. Mind you, printing has changed and they can press the button again and you can have another 100,000 co- copies in three days. It's not a big deal. But it's, it's an internal thing to make sales reps and everyone working in the sales force at Penguin, the marketing department at Penguin, all of the reps in the field feel that this is important and just, you know, steadily put the pressure on to get copies in stores, to get booksellers excited about it, to get booksellers to display it, to get them to hand sell it. Apparently it hasn't been working so well. And the reason this article exists is to explore why. Um, I don't know. There's, yeah, there's a few things with it like that, that I thought were interesting in this article. One is going to that point exactly, <clears throat> that according to the current numbers on – which have, are outdated, obviously, now, um, from the Nielsen book scan, they had sold around 13,000 copies, not including ebooks, which isn't a very, I mean, it's a huge number for, for a lot of people and a lot of presses, but not necessarily for the largest acquisition in Penguin's history or one of the largest ones with a print run of that size. Um, it also says the reviews stateside have been so far sparse and not exactly positive. Newsday called the novel a lumbering contrivance, and the Washington Post characterized it as one of, quote, Ernest Lardinus. Uh, and then uh, it goes on to say, if Dicker is right, and this goes back to an earlier point that I want to talk about in a second, if French readers have been denied easy-to-swallow sentences and swiftly moving plot, then it makes sense that his novel did so well over there. But there's no deficit of quote-unquote readable books written in English and available in America. Literature isn't immune to the rules of capitalism. This might just be a matter of supply and demand. Which I don't know about that part entirely. I think that that's one or two steps too far. But the idea that like he's he goes going back to like when he's talking about French books, he's like they're just autofiction. They're just self-indulgent. It's always like raining outside with people standing in their um in their living room talking about the two women that they want to have sex with and being self-obsessed and terrible and it's boring and no one wants to have a uh, a plot so on and so forth so he gave them this page turner good book um yeah and i can see why this would be an attractive thing to to have somebody who's not an intellectual who's not well back who's not you know BHL stand up there and, you know, say that, hey, we can make, uh, we don't all have to try to be Camus or Sartre or, or, you know, but George Bataille or any of these kind of people, like we can write books that, you know, are, you know, easier sentences to digest and all of this sort of stuff. And it's, I can see why it'd be attractive in Europe. Right. Like we've long, long ago gotten well past that sort of belief that only good books are readable books in America. Right. And, and you know, it's almost swung the other way, whereas no one reads difficult books. No one talks about like massive audiences for difficult books. That's just right. not ever going to happen. So, I mean, yes, I think she might have a point, you know, like you said, it's maybe a little too far. It's, you know, the laws of supply and demand. If this is a good book, just simply written, it would sell, right? I would, I would think so. I think that one of the big problems or one of the dangers on Penguin's part was that uh, it is set in America, in contemporary America, which yeah. is going to immediately strike everyone as something that they could be uber critical about or at least raise questions. And every person I've talked to that's read this had that same, brought that up was like, well, some of the America parts are just a little bit off and, and bothersome, things like that. And that's, that is, like, if it's, a, if it's set in, like, whatever, like, the 60s in America, like, that's fine. No one's going to really, like, get too up in arms about that, I doubt, unless it's really egregious. But in today, set in 2000 and whatever it is, like, 2008, 2009 America, that's going to be, I don't know, that's begging. Also, he seems kind of arrogant. His picture is awful. His picture is awful. Which makes it like it makes it easier to just be like, no, <laughs> your America is shit. Also, this 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 quote from here, I mean, granted, you're picking out of a seven hundred page book like four lines, but here is here is a uh, a bit of dialogue from this book. Do you have any change? No. Keep it then. Thank you, writer. 
I'm not a writer anymore. <laughs> and also, rain never hurt anyone. If you're not brave enough to run in the rain, you'll certainly never be brave enough to write a book. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's, that's... <laughs> well, you should point out the, you have to, the, the, the great line from uh, right before that. The... What does it say? Um... The dialogue barely surpasses Laura Mipsum in its specificity. <laughs> I left that, I left that up because that was my same joke for the Australian book. Yeah, <laughs> we had the same. We went with the same thing of just like uh, nonsense. I think the crux of it is like the paragraph right before that. I think it's just one, two sentences. The book itself seems almost cynically designed to be popular in the United States. It's familiar, set in New England, but fancy by a francophone. It's fun, a page turner, but sophisticated seeming because it's about writers. It's easy to see why people in the publishing world would be attracted to it, and that's absolutely true. That that key of people in the publishing world is really like the, the bit. Like that, that it's clear. I, I can understand why people in the publishing world, and that that making it trying to make a that if people in the publishing world like it, it will sell is a jump that doesn't always work. And then there's this: the fact that there's a novel within a novel about the author of another novel isn't handled. With any sort of postmodern panache, and neither are the literary allusions to Roth and Mailer, a food obsessed Jewish mother, boxing matches, which might actually just be cliched writing. <laughs> oh, God. It's yep. pretty damning. I wanted to read this when it was first, when I first heard about it, because there was an article in like, the New York Times about how this was going to be the big thing or whatever, and I hadn't heard of it at all up until then. So I got the, um, the ebook from NutGalley, and then I never started it, and now I do not think I'm going to. No, I mean, I can't imagine either of us reading this book. No, I really can't. Uh, you know, what? Way, looking at Nielsen book scan numbers, according to this, which is, what do we say, two thirds, somewhere around there, it's yeah. sold 10,000 copies. So. Yeah. It's better than the 13,000 a few weeks ago. Sure. This, book is for, this book is on sale at Wegmans, our local grocery store, and Tops, the other local grocery store. Penguin has a very good sales force. Yeah, I. I cannot imagine that anyone's actually buying it from either of those places, but it is one of the few times that you ever see something like that. Something that we talk about on our podcast showing up in the local local grocery aisle in Rochester. Yeah. You know what book I do really like? That, have you ever heard of um, People Who Eat Darkness? Sounds familiar, but I couldn't... It was... Um, I got it from uh, uh, Ryan Chapman when he was at FSG because they brought it out. I think they did this maybe a paperback. I'm not sure anymore. Um, yeah, I guess it was just a paperback original a couple years ago in 2012. And it's about this woman who was murdered in Japan and like the search for her and like all the legal things that came up about it. And I've been listening to it on audiobook and it's it's amazing. It seems like the sort of thing you would probably like too. Because it's kind of dark and very and and fairly like odd. And interesting in the kind of search for things. I um, totally remember someone told me about this. I'm assuming it was uh, who was it? The subtitle is "The True Story of a Young Woman Who Vanished from the Streets of Tokyo and the Evil That Swallowed Her Up." And it really is like the beginning is great because she goes missing, and then her roommate gets these phone calls from someone being like, "You know, she's decided to join this new religion. She's not coming back. She's gone. She's gonna she's gonna be part of our our cult." Blah blah blah. blah. And so it's like all like very sketchy for, for up until I still haven't gotten to like them finding her body, although I know that she's dead. Yeah, somebody else recommended it to this. I gotta maybe I should pick up a copy. It's pretty cool. I could send you my galley if you want. Um, um speaking of galleys, I just started reading the new Martin Amos book. Do you know about this? I didn't know there was a new Martin Amos book. I didn't either until uh um who gave it to me? Stephen Sparks when I was in San Francisco. Yeah. Oh, I have the new uh, Amos galley upstairs in the office. Do you want it? And I said, absolutely. Um, it's called... The Zone uh, of Interest? Zone of Interest, yes. It's a weird Holocaust book. Um, oh I don't know how else to explain it. Um, except I feel like it's a little bit like... What, who was the big French? The Tells book. Oh, like the banality of evil, the banality of bureaucracy, of you know, evil because it, it's treating. I mean, look, I'm 50 pages in, but it's, it's all about how mundane these, you know, SS people running concentration camps 
treated their jobs like it was just paper pushing kind of thing. I'm sure, and it's, you know, look, they, they gloss over some truly horrifying things in a way that, you know, really gets to you. That said, I mean, I've seen Brazil, and uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Terry Gilliam movie, and he always said that the uh, torturer, do you know what I'm talking about, where he goes and visits his friend who happens to be a torturer? Right. And uh, he's in his office, and then he's like, oh, got to go back to work. And his like little girl is sitting there in his office, like two days before Christmas, playing with toys in a Christmas tree, and then he just opens the door and goes into like this, you know, horrible torture scene uh-huh. and puts on this mask. And Terry Gilliam has always said that that is the most evil character he's ever created, because that's a man who just murder, you know, torture is his job, evil is his job, and then he just immediately turns it off and goes back to what he was doing. Right. And that that's terrifying. That, that's kind of what I feel like I'm reading, except I've already seen that movie. You know what I mean? I don't, oh, right. I don't know that I need to read this book. I don't. Huh. And you're a huge Martin Amos fan. I am a huge Martin Amos fan. This is true. I, would, I mean, a sentence level of writing is so damn good that you just keep reading it. So I probably will finish it. I just, I'm curious to see if he's going to do anything different than what Gilliam did, basically. Right. I don't know if it's possible. You know what I mean? And look, don't, don't hold this against me. I'm, I'm going to quote Banksy here, um, who I do not think is uh, much of an artist. But he has a, a painting, or whatever you want to call what he does, called The Banality of the Banality of Evil. And it's like we've now gotten to this point where like, talking about the banality of evil is kind of banal. And it's, I think, kind of true. Yeah. You know, we're just kind of inundated with this viewpoint. And it's like, can we go back to just you know, being shocked by the actual horror and not the but people who treated it as not very horrific. Anyway, I'm on a rant. And it's, it's a, you still have a rant to go I to. I still have a rant. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, real quickly, so if, I'll, I'll put a link to this, but there's the Penguin Cup. It's some thing that Penguin UK is doing where they have the, the top 11, the starting 11 for each country based on their literature. So like for England, we'll just use England because it's easy. They have a goalkeeper of Ian McEwen, Nick Hornby, Byron Keats, Zadie Smith, Jane Austen, William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, J.K. Rowling, um, Agatha Christie, and George Orwell are their starting team. And then they have like star player George Orwell with accuracy. Of, it has like a card, like of a trading card, but like without a picture, which is just fucking stupid too. Um, just a picture of the flag. Um, and then their stats, accuracy, 93%, prophetic vision, 94 attacking, injustice, 90%, defending the weak, 95 which is stupid. This whole thing is stupid, and it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything, and when they were tweeting about it on their Penguin Cup um, Twitter thing, they misspelled Columbia. They spelled it with a U, like the, the yes. cow at the university and not like the country, which is bad. People... From Columbia, I really don't like when you do that. <laughs> no, for obvious reasons. For very obvious reasons. But Penguin came up with some idea that's stupid, and I just want to point that out. Yes, and while we're on this, can I say, and I know, look, I'm, I'm not going to point fingers or name names here because these are all people who volunteered a lot of time to, to help us out in our, um, I would say, perhaps foolish literary world. <laughs> up. Um, the treating them as matches thing it's not a not a thing I agree with. <laughs> I, I just like the metaphors. The <laughs> it just does not work for me. I I, I don't like it. At I all. I think I only used one reference in mine. I think I red carded Australia just because I had to get one last insult in, and that was the only way I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> that thing was just one pure string of insults. There's no nothing else there, but. Anyways, my, my rave is sort of dependent upon being able to see things, so people are going to have to look at it online. So do you want to do your rant, and then I can just finish this off in the brief ways? Uh, so sure. you have to go. Yeah, I got like 10 minutes. Um, okay. My rant is, uh, and if anyone is familiar with, I think it was Ken Brockman on The Simpsons with like one of those stupid, you know, two second news stories before moving on to something else where he says, you know, they have a picture on the screen and it just says, I think it's a picture of mole man, the old man who's like half blind. 
Mm-hmm. And it says, man yells at cloud, and there's a picture of him, like, shaking his fist at the cloud. <laughs> yeah. Kind of how I feel uh, with this rant. Because I live in New York City, and it's very hot here in the summer, which I love. Don't get me wrong. But if you've ever been to New York City, and specifically Manhattan, or any other more densely uh, populated um, part of the city, not my street in Brooklyn, it stinks. And it stinks because garbage stinks. So I'm here to rant against decomposition because I hate it and it makes everything stink. And because it's hot <laughs> out, things start rotting more quickly, uh, which only further exacerbates the problem. And the trash is just everywhere. And it's just, it's so humid that the moisture and the heat and trapped in plastic and it just, it's an endless, vicious circle of decomposition and it's and it's really really disgusting and it stinks you get i ride my bike i get off the bridge and immediately you're hit with like this wall of stink that's no good the streets of new york city oh shit sorry man go on (laughs) you got stink sorry i'm trying to find the name of this thing and it just started blaring at me i did not hear anything oh good 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 all right so that's all. I don't really, there's no cure for this problem. <laughs> like maybe if we had better garbage men? I don't really know. I don't really see maybe how. We didn't, what if we, yeah, did more composting internally? I don't know. Uh, who knows? There's, it doesn't smell bad here, so I don't have that complaint. Well, no, it's just, it's a, it's a, there are too many people living here, and that's, that's kind of the problem. I know that the, the subway in August in New York may be the worst thing ever. It's yeah. It uh, it's really hard to air condition those things. Was above like ninety degrees. I sweat a lot, and I really hate feeling like that sheen instantly in places. And that that that's always whenever I go to New York in August, it's like walking, just feeling like gross, just gross, <laughs> just gross. So my rave is going to come out of um, my trip to Estonia from a few weeks ago. One of the people that I'd met her before several times, but um, but who I talked to a lot there was this woman, Kaisa Kair, who is the translator into Estonian of Harry Potter and the other J.K. Rowling books, um, to give her a claim to fame. But she had sent me, after I left, I asked her about like uh, Estonian music and stuff, and she sent me a series of these videos that her brother was part of that was kind of like an Estonian Monty Python troupe. And I'm going to put a couple of them on here. One that's really, they're, they're all pretty funny. There's one about like um, these Soviet soldiers that come to this people's house and like knock it down, knock down their door while they're eating dinner. And the, the, the people at the table are just like, you know, what's going on? What's happening? And they're like, you're being deported. And they're like, deported? What does that even mean? And they're like, deported. We're going to take you and we're moving you out of here. And they're like, where are you moving us? And they're like, Siberia. And they're like, well, how much is it going to cost us? And they're like, nothing we're deporting you and they're like oh this is awesome we won the the siberian sweepstakes sort of thing um but there there's a number of these that are uh, pretty awesome there's one that i don't even want to give away any part of it except i want you to watch it and it's all about knight rider the tv show as opposed to some other night rider as opposed to the regular knight rider that just rides through the night yeah no like 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 the kit knight rider and and drinking and driving it's kind of brilliant and I, they say, I can't give, there's nothing, I, this is just a visual one, but I want to rave about these videos because I watched like 12 of them one day and they're all pretty fantastic. Like short little, there's one about like um, teaching people how to be good drunk swimmers, which is pretty good. It's like a, a, a camp where they have a guy who's like, who, who gets, who's always going around yelling at people for drinking too much water and how they have to become better drunk swimmers. And there's a, one about that, a lot of them that deal with like Estonian politics where they had like a problem where people would rent out a a flat to like hundreds of of Soviet companies of Russian companies I mean um, so that Russians could have EU status or their companies could be operating in the EU since Estonia is part of the EU um, so they have a various one about that where people are like crammed into this little house doing all their business and various things like that but they're pretty funny and they're something that I highly doubt anyone in America has come across unless you know someone from Estonia who like turned you on to this which considering who listens to our podcast you never know there might be it's quite possible but i'm going to also I'll open with some sort of estonian music when i when i do this but that's my that's my my rave my rave was i like these videos i find them very entertaining and i really liked going to estonia and latvia which we never talked about and that's my two cents for it and 
So, if you had to go back to one place or the other, Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I will never go back to Las Vegas unless I, am, unless I am forced to. I did not not very much enjoy Las Vegas. Mm. Right. It's it's fine. Like it's fine. I guess there's there. Let me qualify that by saying that there there are a few specific moments that were incredibly fun, and there are certain things about it that are like entertaining to see or to witness or to like be around. But that lasts about two days. I was there for almost a week. Um, that is way too much. That is way too long. That is not good. Um, but for a couple of days, there are certain fun things like being able to like go to the bar at nine a.m. in the morning with all these people to watch the U.S. Germany game get some $2 beers, watch these people who had been there all night sitting next to me at the bar, uh, smoking cigarettes constantly and playing video poker and drinking with me. That was pretty entertaining, especially because I asked for a coffee because it was 9 a.m. And they're they like, oh, sure, we can do that. So they brought me a coffee and a beer stein with like a little piece of paper around it so Wait, I wouldn't so burn my hand. They have the means to make coffee. <laughs> but they had no coffee cups. No. 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 Just a pint, just a pint glass, <laughs> just a fucking pint of coffee that they gave me. That's entertaining. I like that. But um, and also there's this place called the Pepper Mill that Mark Benelli and then Carolyn Kellogg also recommended. And that place is fucking amazing because it's like literally stuck in the 70s and feels like you're going to be uh, stuck in a conversation with like a, a CD ma- magician at any moment in time. And it's weird. And it's got like brown pink chairs and neon everywhere and plastic plants. And it's cheap which is very nice. Um, I like that. But the rest of it's just like big and obnoxious and like so it's like it's it's like just just it's like the movies and the, like the shitty part of the movies. Got it. That's all I have to say about that. Oh, there was there were a couple of cool places, but in, for the most part for 7 days it is not. That is too much. No one should be there for 7 days. Never actually been there. You're not missing a lot. Like everything you imagine, it is. Like there's, it's not like there's some secret cool part to Las Vegas. It is what you think it is. It is endless casinos, a weird dance clubs, lots of people dressed up in very odd ways, um, way too expensive drinks, and uh, sports betting. Well, that last thing is uh, what I'm really curious about. I would like to someday sit in front of a wall of TVs and be able to gamble on everything I'm watching. I did that, but I didn't gamble. But I did take home a sheet. I don't know where it is now. But a sheet that I got from um, the Nick During from uh, uh, New York Review of Books and I hung out and watched the Germany um, uh, Algeria game at, in one of those places, and they have like leather seats, and you can just sit there and bet it with the the woman who comes down and takes your bets and all that kind of stuff. And there was a betting sheet there, like a uh, to place things, and I could not figure it out. Like there, there's too much going on. There's way too much going on. Oh uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of you know. I forget what they're called, but uh, yeah, you want to bet on multiple things and your odds go, you make more money. Yeah. And there's, but like even the numbers, like on any given game, it wasn't like you could just bet on one or the other. There's like too many, there's just too many things happening. It was too much for me. I didn't want to sit down. I would have, if I would have known how to bet on things, I probably would have, and I probably would have lost. But, um, but it was, it was, it was beyond my capabilities, but watching everything in front of those huge screens and stuff is cool. Um, and I would have enjoyed doing that more, but because of the time difference and because I was there for the um, American Library Association conference, when we got out, most things were done. Mm. Since all the games were starting start oh, right. so early. So at the time change, is just like, it wasn't, it wasn't as feasible. Like, I'd go and catch, like, the Dodgers game, and that would be it. So it wasn't as cool as, like, when there's, like, 12 games going on, and you can watch everything and bet on, like, whether or not someone's going to get a hit in that next at-bat. How many runs there'll be in an inning? Things like that. You can bet on it all. You can. You can bet on literally anything, it seems. So, I guess that's everything. My, that's my, everything. Our rants and raves are a little bit. We got to up our game next time. Yeah. Although, I want you to see this video. They're, they're pretty entertaining. I think people will like them. Yeah. It's embedded in the post. It's impossible to describe it on, on radio in any funny way. So, um, all right. Well, thanks for having everyone. And uh, Chad, we will do this again. Oh, you know, one, one more thing. What's our what's our uh, uh, email address again? Isn't it just three percent podcast at gmail.com? At gmail.com. Yep. 
that's what I thought so too. I wasn't sure if I had podcasts or not, but I'll include that again. And I don't know if you've been checking it, if we've been getting any, uh, any we get some spam. We get a lot of spam. Come on, guys. Send us something cool. That isn't spam. That isn't spam. Thank it's not you. Even good spam. It's just boring spam. I, I, you know what I keep getting fucking spam is these. They, we have this new system at the U of R where it prevents the spam from even getting to you. And they send you an email telling you what all your spam is in case anything's not spam. And every single one of mine is like, get a $25 Petco gift card. <laughs> get a $25 Lowe's gift card. Which is shitty spam, too. Anyway, thanks for listening. Send us an email. We'll do it again soon. <laughs> okay. Bye, man. Take care. Bye. Bye.